Hey Booktube, it's Angie. I think it's been a little bit since my last video. So I thought I would do uh, a few more today. So uh, I'm gonna film these. I have a couple of uh, Let's Try videos to do. Uh, so you'll probably see a couple where I'm wearing the same shirt, but they won't necessarily go up at the same time. I'm just putting these in the, <laughs> in the file, but they'll be up pretty soon, uh, but not together. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's been a little bit since, since I've posted anything. Um, I know I said I was going to try to, try to be better about, um, being more consistent with the uploads and I am trying to do that. It's just, uh, my body keeps giving out on me. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, to get into today's video, uh, I wanted to do another, uh, like I said in the first one I tried to do, uh, it's kind of like an author spotlight, but I figured I would just call my list Let's Try, where I'll just pick... I'm not necessarily going to do somebody's entire catalog, uh, unless, you know, like, in this case, uh, it's only... the person only has a couple books out. <laughs> um, then I might try to do everybody's... or not everybody's... then then I might try to do <laughs> their whole catalog because there's only a couple of books. But if it's somebody that's like really prolific, I'm not going to do a author spotlight where I'm doing like, you know, 8, 10, 12 books all at once because <laughs> we'll be here forever uh, unless you guys want like a freaking Lawrence of Arabia live stream or something. Uh, yeah, I'm just picking like two or three. Um, maybe for if they're like smaller books. I'd, I'm probably gonna top it at that though. Uh, and just sort of sample writers, um, people that have come up in my attention a lot or people that have been suggested to me a lot or uh, people I just have multiple books on my shelf by them and I'm just trying to clear space. <laughs> so uh, in that vein, today I wanna talk about uh, Jean Kwok. So right now, Jean Kwok, I believe it's, these are the only two she has out right now. She has another one coming out uh, in June of 2019, I think, this this summer. Uh, but I'll talk about that at the end of the video. But I believe her two out right now are Girl in Translation, get in frame, <laughs> and uh, Mambo in Chinatown. And uh, Jean Kwok is from a uh, immigrant family herself so a lot of her fiction has to do with the immigrant experience. Uh, I think her family immigrated from Korea I believe. I think I wrote it down. Uh, no, Hong Kong. They immigrated from Hong Kong. I think I read it's either in the interview or at the back of this book. I don't know if this one... I don't think this one had like an author supplement thing at the back of this book. So I think it was an interview I read where uh, Jean Kwok said that this one isn't, I think this is the first one that came out, if I remember right. This one isn't um, directly a autobiographical novel, but it's like partially autobiographical. There are some things from her actual life that were inspired uh, that the, <laughs> how do you say that? Uh, that inspired the characters in this book. Yeah, kind of twisted around there. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I believe this was the first one she came out with, so I guess we'll start here. Let me put this book down over here. So, Girl in Translation is the story of Akim, uh, who, Akim Chang, who uh, immigrates from uh, China to the States when she's about 11 years old with her mother. Uh, her mother was a music teacher in, in China. I forget what her father did, but he suffers an unexpected stroke and passes away. And her mother tries to raise her on the music teacher salary, but she was struggling too much. Um, it's, she wasn't making ends meet, and she was not sure what she was going to do with her husband gone and her child. It's... <laughs> At the time, um, a little too young to start working. Kim's mother in the States, uh, she's already married and has a family there, uh, she offers a place for Kim and her mother to come out. And she said, oh yeah, it's the land of opportunity and 
we have a place for you ready to go and you just you can start a whole new life here and it just this opportunity is perfect opportunity just seems to fall in her lap and with no better option to come up they they decide they're gonna go try it in the states and see what happens their first few days there it is kind of overwhelming and amazing with all of these different sights and new foods and sounds they're not familiar with and um, just <laughs> they they land in New York City so there's a lot of noises that they're not used to and um, a lot of like bustling and and you know the New York City environment and they get to uh, Kim's aunt's house and uh, they talk about how they're amazed with things like carpet and um, hot water on demand all the time whenever you want it and little things like that that weren't necessarily available uh, in China at that time and so uh, they're they're really excited about this this new life they're gonna have and they're eager to see this apartment that uh, her sister has set up for her and everything but when they see the apartment, they find out that they've been a little bit bamboozled by the family. Uh, the apartment that the sister had set aside for Cam's mother actually ends up being kind of a dump uh, in a Brooklyn ghetto. And there's just, there's bugs everywhere, stuff's broken, the building smells gross. It's just, but they don't know what to do because they have no money on them. Um, they don't have money. At that time, they didn't really speak English. So they have limited resources until things can get figured out down the road. So they figure they don't really have an option but to try to make this nasty-ass apartment work. And then they also, uh, once they get settled into the apartment, they find that they actually don't have much <laughs> land of opportunity available to them either. Um, having no money, having an undesirable location to, or a, you know, address, um, not speaking English, not having references, not having um, schooling background, anything like that. They can't really get like the prime jobs to really get your life going. So they're sort of just left with the only option to take is to start working in a sweatshop in in uh, Brooklyn. Both Kim and her mother take jobs. So Kim is pretty quickly, She's she also has to go to school because she's only like 11, 12 years old. So pretty quickly she uh, has to not only work at the sweatshop but also maintain her grades at her new school. And the school life is really hard for her at first because the kids make fun of her, her teachers kind of look at her funny um, or with pity or, you know, it's just, it's not a very welcoming environment. She's even got one teacher that makes fun of her a lot or um, jokes about her accent and makes cracks about her, you know, not knowing American culture well enough, which is crazy because I'm like, she just got here. <laughs> uh, so she has a really unfair start. In the beginning and not surprisingly a year or so of this going on with just everybody on top of her and making her feel like crap uh, Kim is actually pretty smart in the story so she picks up language pretty well given a window of time <laughs> and though her grades pick up and she gets more comfortable with the lesson plans and things like that she develops a bit of a rebel uh, personality or, or side to her anyway because there's part of her that can't help but feel well, what is the point <laughs> um, nobody really expects much of me people just look at me as a dirty immigrant um, so uh, for a little while in the story she gives up a little bit on herself and starts playing hooky a lot and giving her mom crap at home and kind of slagging a little bit at work and just doing bare minimum until I forget what it is but there was something in her that that some catalyst uh, I forget what it, is, it was exactly but something in the story where uh, she realizes hold on <laughs> um, I want a little bit b better for myself she's looking at it as she sees what her mom's life is now like her mom started out having a really 
nice, comfortable life with a good man. And then her man was taken from her unexpectedly. And then her mother had to shuffle really quick and figure out how to keep a roof over her daughter's head. And on one hand, Kim starts to have respect for what her mom works through uh, to make things happen and the sacrifices she makes. But on the other hand, there's maybe... I don't know if it's really a resentment. It might be a little bit of more like embarrassment that she doesn't live in a better condition. Um, Kim decides she doesn't really want that life for herself. She wants better. And it dawns on her that if you want better, you have to have the schooling or at least some kind of training to back it up. It's <laughs> at least in, in this story. Um, in recent years, it seems like you don't necessarily have to have a great skill. You just have to have a stupid stunt that catches on for a while. Uh, but I, I think, <clears throat> sorry, that came out a little bit better. Um, I think long term, though, if you want something that's going to have longevity as far as success, you do need some sort of skill set. Um, the, <laughs> the people I was being a little bit bitter about. Uh, they're flash in the pan, a lot of them. Um, flash in the pan that might last for a few years, but eventually not having a skill set other than being a moron and having it be entertaining, that's going to burn out. <laughs> You're going to need something that will carry you into, you know, your later years when your body starts to go and things like that. Uh, and she just realizes... She just wants something good for herself. She wants to live in a clean environment and not worry about food and all of those kind of things. <coughs> she just wants to be comfortable. So that's sort of the, the gist with this one. You have the immigrant experience story uh, as far as the balance between coming from what you know into something you don't and trying to make that your new reality all of those things, the transitions, the difficulties in that. And then you also have the mother-daughter relationship aspect of the novel, especially uh, a tense daughter mother-daughter relationship where there are um, problematic elements and maybe resentments going back and forth and just general uncomfortable feelings that take a while to get resolved and talked about, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a little bit hard to talk about this one because I feel like in this particular one the plot was a little bit underdeveloped. Uh, I was reading through this and I, I, the thing about this one is I really liked the environment of this book but the family itself, uh, I felt more bonded to this family, um, Kim and her mother, in this story than I did with the family in Mambo in Chinatown. Uh, <laughs> but I did really like the environment here. It's just, there were a lot of questions. It's that type of story where there's a lot of questions that are just sort of dropped off. <laughs> you get really invested and then things just aren't answered. They're not fleshed out. And you're just, you got to make up your own storyline, I guess. <laughs> uh, and I found that a little bit irritating. Because, you know, I like a clean story uh, where... You know, loose ends are tied up, at least in some way. It doesn't have to necessarily be a happy ending, but uh, there were just too many open-ended questions and ideas that didn't go fully somewhere in this one. Uh, it was a little problematic. Uh, but <laughs> I will say, this one, though, I would recommend giving this to anybody you know that is getting a little bit whiny and privileged um, for for your taste or for their own good. <laughs> because in this story, <coughs> oh my goodness, uh, it's a reality check. Um, I, I think for anybody, if you start to get a little bit comfortable in your lifestyle and think that like the minor, my, most minor inconveniences just, oh my god, just life ending. Take a read of this story uh, and read Kim's story of <laughs> being in this position where, okay, there's something you want in life. And, and Kim has to figure out how she gets this thing and she, she 
uh, equates it to how many skirts she'll have to make in the sweatshop. And she realizes she makes about a cent and a half. Isn't that right? Yeah. Cent and a half per skirt. So everything she wants in life, as far as like uh, material things, she has to do the math on, okay, how many hours do I have to work? How many skirts do I have to make at a cent and a half for a whole skirt? to have this thing that I want. And I mean, I've had to do that math too because I've worked minimum wage jobs, but I think the lowest minimum wage I've ever worked in my life was like $5 an hour. <laughs> uh, and I'm just sitting there equating. And I thought that was, and that was when I was like a teenager. Uh, and I thought I was poor then, but I was thinking, you know, it, I, I never had to do a sweatshop sewing or anything like that. Um, I did have to do some pretty hardcore manual labor at times, but I never had to sit there and, and figure out, okay, if I make a pile of skirts at a cent and a half, not just for a band, for the entire skirt, to get like, I don't know, a, a pair of shoes or a new shirt or something like that's, that's insane. So. It's definitely a good story if you you yourself or you know somebody needs to check their privilege or anything like that. So I will say that about that. Okay, so uh, into Mambo in Chinatown. This story is a little bit different. Uh, similar as far as like the immigrant aspect. But um, the characters and setup are... It's... <laughs> I will say this one... And I don't think this one was quite as dreary, um, I don't think, uh, as Girl in Translation. This one you get a little bit more upbeat scene. There are some sad elements to the story, but you get a little bit more up scene because the majority of this book takes place in a uh, ballroom dance studio. So the story here is uh, Chan Lan, Chan, Chan Lan Wong, who again, taking up an American name, she goes by Charlie. She is the daughter of Chinese immigrants. The story with Charlie is she has never left the sort of city border of Chinatown in New York City. Never been out of outside of Chinatown city limits in her life. And she's like 22 when the story starts. And <coughs> nobody in the story seems to think much of Charlie. Um, she did poorly in school. She had a hard time picking things up in her studies. Did manage to finish school, but she is one of those characters where she just, nobody really has any faith in her, so she doesn't really pick up a lot of skills. She doesn't uh, have any real domestic skills to speak of. She's kind of homely looking, doesn't really know how to dress herself, at least like, you know, with fashion or anything like that. She just sort of wears whatever. Uh, she's very sort of bulky and tomboy in her mannerisms and, and things. Uh, like I said, not real bright as far as intelligence. Um, and she just overall has a very... <laughs> underskilled way about her. She's not super tech savvy. She's not um, really like socially smooth. Pretty uncoordinated and bubbly. So <laughs> she's had this job working at, as a dishwasher at the restaurant where her dad is a noodle maker. And they explain pretty quickly in the story that, that that's really all anybody ever expects out of her. They're just like, well, that one turned out to be kind of a disappointment, but I guess that's her lot in life. Until Charlie's younger sister, Lisa, gives her the idea to go apply for this receptionist job at a local ballroom dance studio. And at first, Charlie was like, why would I do that? <laughs> because she's had her whole life people telling her that she's not good at things and why should she try for things that she's she's believing that about herself now which uh on that level I totally related to Charlie because I had a similar upbringing where um I was kind of left to myself I was in the background a lot um 
I, I, <laughs> I didn't do poorly in school. I was actually a really good student. Uh, but nobody really, my parents never really got into my extracurricular interests that much. Um, they put a lot of interest in my brother. Like I said, I was just sort of in the background. Uh, they didn't really get into what I was into. <laughs> uh, they didn't really go out of their way to look into things that that would maybe fuel me because they just uh, people just didn't expect it out of me and they just assumed that I, I didn't have interests I didn't I was just this tomboy that took care of myself <laughs> um so I, I related to Charlie on that but uh I feel bad for her though because just the way you start the story with her where somebody gives her an opportunity to get out of the rut she's in and she's just she's already sort of like dead inside where she's like why would I do that what the but her sister keeps pushing it and finally she's like you know what I guess I'll try and her sister basically tells her you know if if you if people expect so little out of you at the very least what do you have to lose you should just at least try it and so Charlie was like, okay, she's got a point. <laughs> so she goes and does the job interview, but kind of screws it up a little bit. She's, you know, like I said, not the most socially comfortable. So she gets a little bit frazzled and she thinks she's bombed it. But uh, one of the co-owners that's doing the interview, she sees something about Charlie where she's like, I don't know, there might be something to her. I think I want to give her a try. And the other owners are like, wait, what? She seems terrible. But um, it's decided that Charlie's going to get this receptionist job. And not surprisingly, when she first starts out, she's kind of terrible at it. Uh, even though some of you might think, um, well, what's so hard about a receptionist job? <laughs> well, you know, if it's that thing again. If people don't have any faith in you to begin with, you have a hard time finding faith in yourself. So she just goes into this job thinking that everybody is judging her, everybody's going to hate her, everybody's going to wait for her to screw up. And when you're in that wheel of thinking, inevitably you are going to screw up. <laughs> so that's kind of where she's at in the story. But she realizes pretty quickly that she loves this world of dance. She loves the environment and... Um, the movement of people and just the beauty of everything. So she figures, she has to figure out how to make this job work. Yes, she doesn't want to leave this world now that she's in it. And <laughs> the way novels work out where these, you know, unrealistic setups happen, one such setup happens to Charlie where uh, there's one dance instructor who... I forget what happens. I don't remember if they get sick or injured or something, but for whatever reason, they can't teach their class one night. And it's just a beginner's uh, dance class. And it's brought to Charlie, well, maybe you should teach to the class. And Charlie was like, what, me? <laughs> I answer the phones. Why am I going to teach the class? And they're like, well, we're sort of short staff. We don't really have anybody last minute to do this class. They're not going to know the difference because these are all starter students. So, yeah, just sort of, like, I don't know, go out there and show them some stuff and work your way through it. <laughs> and so, naturally, she goes into this class and she's nervous as hell, but she's like, okay, well, I guess I'll just try something. <laughs> and it turns out that uh, Charlie does fumble her way through this class as the instructor, and she ends up being a big hit because people interpret her fumbliness as, oh, she's trying to make herself relatable and make it seem like, you know, she's learning too. And, oh, we love that. We love that she came down on our level and it made us so much more comfortable. So, yeah, we want to do more classes with her. And so when, when all these people finish the class and they tell the owners they want more classes with Charlie and then word gets back to Charlie, she's like, well, crap. Because <laughs> she doesn't actually know how to dance. She just sort of like, you know shuffled through a few moves and went da da <laughs> so uh the the owners are scrambling trying to figure out what to do because they're saying you know these are paying customers who want to return that's what you want for a business what do we do about this and so the decision is made to 
covertly give Charlie dance lessons on the sly <laughs> so that she can go back in and teach these beginner students uh, these beginner dance moves. And so she is learning all these things at the same time they are, but at different times so that they don't know. So they have instructors come in um, real quietly and like off time to, to teach Charlie these moves. And it's through this world of dance that Charlie starts to find her confidence a little bit. And she starts to learn that she doesn't need everybody else's approval to believe in herself all of a sudden, especially with her parents. Uh, her parents dog her a lot. And Charlie talks about how when she's tried to do girly things in the past and tried to get dressed up, tried to do her hair, her parents always dog her a little bit and say, oh, well, what are you trying for? You know, who are you trying to impress? What's all this about? And they just make her awkward because she tried to be pretty. And again, it, <laughs> it choked me up a little bit reading her story because I had something similar when I was growing up. Uh, <clears throat> my parents only had, they had my brother first and then I was the unexpected baby. Um, or, or as my mom put it, we were expecting you just like maybe three or four years down the road before you showed up. Um, but Technically, I was an unexpected baby. <laughs> she, you know, told me her birth control failed and ta-da, here we are with an Angie. And my parents were unprepared. <laughs> um, they were still trying to figure out how they wanted to raise my brother. I came along and for some reason they said they didn't really know what to do with a girl. So their thinking was, we'll just go the same route we did with our son. So, uh, I had a very, um, probably much more masculine driven upbringing than, than a lot of girls. Uh, not, you know, like in a butch way necessarily, like I had dolls and stuff and with war dresses and things like that, but it was more like, uh, whatever we teach our son, we're going to teach our daughter to kind of thing. And, uh, when I was younger, I got a lot of my brother's hand-me-downs. Uh, so, like, my parents would save money by getting me girl jeans in my size, but then they would give me, like, my brother's old, uh, like, beat-up t-shirts and flannels and stuff. Uh, so, they got used to me being in that look. And I didn't know any different because I was a child. I couldn't go out and buy my own clothes. Uh, so, I just wore whatever was available. But as I got older and I started realizing, hey, I would like to be pretty once in a while. And I tried to go out and, you know, get makeup and, and more feminine clothes and all those kind of things. My parents had the same reaction where they were like, what are you doing? Who are you trying to impress? And even my friends growing up, they were the same way. Where if I tried to put on a dress or a skirt just because, you know, just out of the blue, because I wanted to feel pretty or something, everybody made a big deal about it. They're like, why are you in a skirt? Do you have somewhere to go later? It's like, it was like I wasn't allowed to embrace that side of me. People just got so used to the tomboy side of me that they made me feel awkward <laughs> whenever I would try anything outside of that. And there are people in my life to this day that still freak out if I wear a feminine top or um, a dress or you know if I do my makeup up a little bit fancier or something they they get freaked out like I've stepped outside my kennel or something and like, whoa what are you doing uh, and it's just like I'm like any other female you have days where you want to be a little bit more on the pretty side there's not an ulterior motive it's not deeper thinking like sometimes you're just kind of feeling yourself and you would like the world to not make you feel bad about it. <laughs> uh, so, and that's kind of where Charlie was in a lot of this, where she just wanted to embrace her femininity and everybody was making her weird about it. Until she got into this dance world and, you know, in the dance world, is it's, it's a normal part of it to embrace your body and its movement and clothing and things like that. So uh, she starts learning how to move her body 
in provocative ways and wearing dance shoes and, and learning how, you know, her leg muscles work in a different way that she didn't expect. And she just, she just really loves the way her body feels doing that. She embraces it and she um, goes home basically and says, screw all y'all. I love this life. I love my body. I love being pretty. Screw all y'all. <laughs> and her whole family is like, what happened to her? She got possessed by a demon or something. Because <laughs> like, they're, they're not used to her speaking up for herself and <clears throat> being proactive and, and confident and all that. And so there's, there's that world that gets explored in the story. And um, one thing I also really liked is, once again, Jean Kwok brings in a little bit of her own life into this story. Again, not fully autobiographical, but Jean Kwok herself uh, does have a ballroom dance background. So she brings a realistic note to this story where she talks about some of the <laughs> less pretty aspects of dancing. She talks about um, the bruises and and blisters and, and injuries you get when you're first learning these moves trying to dance with a partner and trying to get to that point of trust with your partner and <laughs> um, having injuries that way because you know you have to get to that place where you sort of know their movements but you know <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight so you have times where your partner will drop you or spin you the wrong way and lose your balance you might twist your ankle and then on top of that there's also you know the process of just the physical needs of the job as far as getting shoes the right type of shoes for dance and breaking those in and how that's a painful process and then the cost of these things um, the cost of the proper dance shoes for the type of dance you're doing and she talks about how there are different types of shoes that you do need there's uh, even if it's all in the same type of ballroom dancing there are still different types of shoes within that world for different step dances you need to do <laughs> and those shoes if you're getting the proper ones they're not cheap so uh charlie has to learn all this and they're like you know if you want to be in this world you got to find the money <laughs> and so she learns so she experiences all these things of trying to make do with inferior products until she can get to where she needs to be with that and um i liked the realistic aspect of that um, having a writer who has that background to bring that into the story and not make it just this fluffy piece about, oh, she got spun around like Cinderella on the dance floor. It's like, no, it was, it was a beast of a job. <laughs> she had to like rewire who she was. So I liked that, that aspect of the story. And then there's also, once again, the, uh, immigrant experience element to the story where, uh, in in this one, uh, Charlie herself is not an immigrant. She's she's born American, but her parents are immigrants, and there's a lot of back and forth between her and her parents, where it's trying to find that balance between respecting the old world and like the mother culture and all that, put against the the more modern American um, upbringing that she knows, and. Charlie always struggles to find balance between um, living her life in the world she's in, acknowledging that she's not from there, she's from here, uh, and embracing this world that she knows, but also not wanting to be disrespectful to her parents and her culture. She wants to honor where she's from and, you know, her, her country's history and all that. But it's just, it's that balance thing again of trying to honor the old um, and also embrace the new world culture without being disrespectful. And part of that comes into play when there's one element of the story where a family member gets sick and it's pretty bad. Um, I don't think it's actually uh, named what this person gets, but it's it, it seems to be some sort of like neurological disease. There's a lot of uh, shaking, seizures, uh, sweating, throwing up, uh, 
night tremors, all kinds of stuff. Bedwetting, I think, is part of it. And it just gets progressively worse for this person. And it comes out of nowhere. And it naturally spooks Charlie. She looks at it as, well, we don't know what it is. And we're in a place where we have modern medicine available. We can take her to the hospital. They can run tests. If it's a neurological thing, hopefully they'll find it pretty quickly. And so she quickly wants to go that route and just knock it out and get her family member on the road to to finding out what's making her so ill. And then <laughs> on the other side of that, Charlie has her father who doesn't trust Western medicine and he wants to use the old world style herbalist that lives in Chinatown. And I th what did they call this person? They had a name. Oh, they just call the the herbalist the vision. And uh, Charlie understands where her father is coming from a little bit. She understands that he wants to honor his roots and use what he knows. Because that's, that's really what it comes to at the end of the day. You just have two people that want to go with what they're comfortable with, what they understand. It's scary using something that you're not used to but it's it's them trying to come together and explain that it's neither side is is scary necessarily they just have to work together but that's just a process is to get to that place where two people are butting heads and trying to work together and saying you know there's probably a common ground we can find here so that's one of the big uh, stresses in Charlie's life is trying to figure out how to not diss her parents and their beliefs but also she doesn't want to watch this family member suffer unnecessarily if there is western medicine that can help this person quickly uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of realness to this story uh, I think I liked the environment just the world itself in Mambo in Chinatown a little bit better than um, Girl in Translation. Like I said, Girl in Translation can get a little bit dreary and heavy in parts. Plus it's just like that nasty ass apartment that so much time is spent in. Uh, but I think I liked the family unit, the family bond in Girl in Translation a little bit better. Um, Mambo in Chinatown, even though it takes place in a, a dance studio and there are interesting characters and everything. The plot itself, it, it drags a little bit in parts where I'm just... <laughs> I remember being antsy when I was reading it, going, can we just... come on? <laughs> and I kept waiting for, you know, the next big drama to happen, but there's a lot of what feels like dead time in the plot that, that kind of made me uncomfortable. Uh, so I'm still in that phase where I'm trying to find, like, just the right sweet spot with Jean Kwok's writing. Um, I do like it, but I haven't found that book yet that I'm like, man, yes! <laughs> but her new book coming out, the one I said that was coming out in this June, I believe, uh, I'm pretty optimistic about that one because that storyline sounds a lot closer to where as far as plots go it sounds much more up my alley I guess um compared to these two and I'm just because I don't know I, th I feel like Jean Kwok has has spaced out her novels pretty well so I'm hoping that that means that her writing has only gotten better the further along you go and uh, so I, I'm pretty interested to see what the new book is so I thought I would uh talk about that a little bit. Um, oh, and then one other thing, you know, I mentioned the uh, girl in translation is good for people that uh, <laughs> want to check their privilege or want somebody else to check their privilege. I, I would say this one is good if you're into underdog stories because Charlie is definitely a classic underdog story setup. <laughs> so there's that. And then I figured I would just close this one on talking about Jean Kwok's new book coming out in June. So the title is uh, Searching for Sylvie Lee. And it doesn't have a super complicated plot, but it does sound interesting. So uh, the idea is there's uh, Sylvie Lee, and then there's her sister... What was her sister's name? Amy. Amy is 
seven years younger than Sylvie. I think the beginning of the story has to do with like their sisterly bond and their relationship with their mother and then uh, Sylvie goes missing. She goes to... what country was it? <laughs> I have like all these notes I'm trying to sort out. Um, Sylvie goes to visit the, their grandmother in the Netherlands and somewhere along the way Sylvie goes missing and then it turns into one of those stories where uh, younger sister Amy decides to take the same path Sylvie did and try to f seek out what she can find out about her sister's disappearance and, and what might have happened to her, is she still alive, all of those things. And in the process uncovers a bunch of family secrets that everybody assumed were going to stay well hidden indefinitely. So, you know, that, that whole setup as far as the disappearance, family secrets, which I know that that kind of plot has been done a million times over, but you never know. You know there's with that particular setup, there's a lot that could be introduced that hasn't been done a lot. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm optimistic. Um, so yeah, that comes out in June. So yeah, I guess we will have to revisit Quack and see what I think. But that's all I have for this one. Uh, thanks for watching, and we will talk soon, guys. Bye.